So first, in the um, handout that you have from the Mother's Agenda, um, you might recall this sentence in the towards the end, in, in which she says, It was like a vision of a great universal rhythm in which each thing takes its own place. So here she is at age 85 in 1965, (laughs) feeling a great relief, Um, but also commenting rather um, ironically about how all of the rules and regulations and efforts to change people didn't do any good. Um, but, 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 they, but what, the re- what she's realizing is that they're okay the way they are. And that realization comes with this experience of the universal rhythm. Everything is an expression of that, but in terms of time and space, everything has its necessary time and space for manifestation. And so the the texture of existence is the body of God. And Sri Aurobindo is frequently generating that that sense, but just because he's generating that sense in Savitri doesn't mean that we're going to necessarily know in our own lives what that really means. And so then she comes to this part of our common experience towards the end of this packet. You know, in the beginning she refers to this November the 17th or whatever it was, 24th um, realization that she had. And then she refers back to that. The message we distributed on the 24th. It was Sri Aurobindo who had told me to keep it for the 24th. That was very clear and very categorical but I didn't know why. But now he has clearly shown me why, and I've well understood, because this power is becoming more and more obvious. Now, we know what she's referring to, right? (laughs) Because it is becoming more and more obvious, and we feel it. This Truth power. And it's not about the mind. This idea of truth has nothing to do with the mind. It has nothing to do with what we think and what we feel and what we believe and our opinions and our uh, judgments and preferences. It's in fact the opposite of all of that. The the divine manifests through its opposites. Sri Aurobindo says this all the time, starting with the commentary on the Isha Upanishad. Mm. Mm. Opposites. Nature is the opposite of the divine. And that's why everything in existence is characterized by positive and negative polarities. Mm -hmm. And that's also why we can turn the experience of pain into the experience of pleasure. Mm -hmm. And that's why we can see in evil good. and the opposite. Mm -hmm. But this is only possible when we rise above the dualities, when we rise above nature. 
So that's what we've been hearing about for the last two days. So she says, And naturally, human thought, which is childish, it has the same attitude towards supramental thought as what we may call animal thought or sentiment has towards human thought or sentiment. It has no idea what it is. Categorically other in philosophical language. It is the other. Hegel wrote a lot about that very nicely. But it's coming closer to the common experience. In 1820, it was farther away than it is now. Do you think all this talk about ascension and fifth dimension and all that is an intimation of that? Yeah, everything is. Things are changing. But they're not going to change all that much. You know, it's, an intu it's called an intuition. Yeah. And um, in the early part of the 20th century, there were some really great minds that had very clear intuitions of another level of reality. And before them, in the early 19th century, there were also many great minds who had these intuitions. So that, that so-called new consciousness is bringing the force, the conscious force of that intuitional field closer. So she said, um, Human thought has almost a need for superstition. Superstition is an ugly word for something that's not ugly. <laughs> it's an ignorant, ingenuous, and very trusting faith. So that's what the, those kinds of intuitions are expressing. even extraterrestrial stuff. And mindfulness stuff. <laughs> um, and well, she says, as soon as you feel the influence of a power, that faith makes you believe in the miracle. It makes you believe that the supramental is going to manifest now, that you are going to become supramental. And that, quite amusingly, I usually, then she goes off on this other thing, I usually have to send out two or three hundred of these messages. Every darshan, everyone asks me for some, uh, for some of them for his correspondence. And, you know, this is the whole religious atmosphere that develops around divinity. And this time I haven't even given a hundred of them. Not even a hundred. Uh, it's not so comfortable, of course. It comes and tells you, no, no, be sensible. Give, a, give out your little messages <laughs> to satisfy the faithful. It's very amusing. I still have my whole stack here. <laughs> then I'm going to skip that paragraph and go down to 
Those who have touched the higher regions of intelligence but haven't mastered in themselves the mental faculties have an ingenuous need for everyone to think as they do. and to be able to understand as they understand. And when they realize that others cannot, don't understand, their first reflex is to be horribly shocked. They say, what a fool. <laughs> But fool isn't the point at all. They are different. They live in another region. You don't go and tell an animal you're a fool. <laughs> you say, it's an animal. Well, you say, it's a man. <laughs> and there we are. <laughs> Only there are those who aren't men anymore and aren't gods yet And those are in a very, in English they say, a very <laughs> awkward position. <coughs> But it was so soothing, so sweet, so marvelous, that vision. Each thing expressing its own <coughs> kind, quite naturally. And then... what we've been talking about here, sort of peripherally. And maybe sometimes very <coughs> tangibly the flame. When the flame lights up. Everything becomes different. Becomes different. But this flame is something totally different. This flame is something totally different. It's totally different from religious feeling, religious aspiration, religious worship. All that is very fine. It's the summit of what man can do and it's very fine. It's excellent for humanity. But this flame, the flame of transformation, is something else. So our endeavor is to familiarize ourselves to whatever extent is possible with that. We invoke the presence and we invoke Savitri and we create in ourselves a stillness in order to acquaint ourselves as far as possible with that. And it entails 
a sacrifice. The self-sacrifice of the mind, the ego mind, the practical mind, the intellectual mind, that's the fuel for the fire. But we're in an awkward position. Because we're very proud of that mind. Oh, I remember now that Sri Aurobindo reminded me of something I had written in Japan, which is printed in prayers and meditations, and I had never understood what I had written. I always tried to understand and asked myself, what the devil did I mean? I have no idea. <laughs> well, she was a beautiful young lady in Japan, <laughs> had a, a lot of paramours and devotees and important roles to play. And, and yet there was something else beginning to happen. It had come like that, and I had written it directly. It was about a child, and it read, Do not come too near him, because you will get burnt. I don't remember the words at all, and I always wondered, what's this child I'm referring to? And why should one take care not to come too near him? And suddenly, only yesterday or the day before, I understood. Suddenly he showed me, he told me, it's this. The child is the beginning of the new creation. It is still in its infancy. So don't touch it if you don't want to be burnt. You, did you catch the subtle implication there? Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go down there. So if we don't want to be burnt, we needn't bother trying to touch it. I mentioned sacrifice a minute ago, the fuel for the flame. The whole mental structure, the whole mental structure has to be sacrificed. Um, So there's a footnote. A couple of footnotes. First, Sri Aurobindo's commentary. It is certainly a mistake to bring down the light by force. To pull it down. The supramental cannot be taken by storm. When the time is ready, it will open of itself. But first, there is a great deal to be done. Mm. 
And that's the sacrifice part. The self-giving, the detachment, the samatha, the universalization of consciousness, the surrender to the energy that's coming down. And that must be done patiently and without haste. And then the prayers and meditations quote from 1917. You see it in your heart. This triumphant hearth. A hearth is a fireplace. (laughs) You alone can bear it without its being destructive. If others touched it, they would be consumed. So who is this you, this Satyavan, the one for whom there is no other choice. So only the individual can know that. It's not something to be collectivized. Do not therefore let them come too near it. The child must know that he must not touch the bright flame that attracts him so much. (coughs) And it's quite clear, she says, that with the breadth and totality of the vision, Something comes which is a compassion that understands. Not that pity of the superior for the inferior, the true divine compassion, which is the total understanding that everyone is what he must be. So here's a nice Buddhistic touch. You know, people often um, say, ask, well, what about compassion in the teaching of the mother and Sri Aurobindo? Because we hear so much about it in Buddhism. But what is the teaching of Buddhism? Wisdom and compassion. The wisdom is the seeing that everything is what it must be and the compassion is the acceptance of all of the stupidity and pain and inevitability of the spatial temporal unfolding. Not only is everything what it must be, but what it must be is not necessarily good or pleasant or free from suffering. And so there is this necessity for an unending embrace and support from the point of view of the Purusha of all of that which Prakriti is. Good, bad and indifferent. The Purusha who is liberated is the one who has the wisdom 
to embrace all of that because that's its essence. It supports all and is itself not any of it. It is unchanging. But it is also sanctioning the whole play because that's the only way for the divine to become manifested the divine consciousness to become manifested in the ignorance. It's not about changing the ignorance so much as it is about liberating itself in the ignorance, through the ignorance. So it's the, this existence is contradictory, essentially. It must be contradictory. It's good for it to be contradictory because it's the, it's the, the principle of the infinite and the finite. And the evolution of consciousness is a process of realizing the infinite in the finite. The true divine compassion is the total understanding that everyone is what he must be. Or everything is what it must be. And if we perceive that in the universal rhythm, it's all divine relatively speaking. <laughs> it's all the divine in relative speaking, relative being. So one of the mysteries of Buddhism that we were discussing a little bit is that Buddhism doesn't essentially try to change all of that. It, it tries to liberate the mind from its delusions about all of that. But with Sri Aurobindo and the mother, it's a little different because Sri Aurobindo sees ahead and he sees the possibility of a manifestation of the divine in the relative that is a little more divine. And he, in the last canto of Savitri, or the last major canto, he says the same thing that the mother is saying in this paper. He says that humanity will have the possibility of fulfilling its potential as a result of the manifestation of the new species. But not until then. And even then, it'll still be humanity. But a more realized humanity. While the new species will have another field of creativity and duration and historical presence. Whatever that might be. Even Sri Aurobindo says we can't really say much about that at this point. But one of the cantos that we'll read 
is as much a visionary revelation of what that could be as anything. It's as much of a stretch as he could achieve. It's called the house of the new creation. There remain only distortions. There was also the explanation of distortions. It was a decisive vision that puts everything in its place. A true revelation. All those things have been told a thousand times. They have been written, I don't know how many times. They have been thought and expressed. All that is very fine up there. But this is seen on the material plane itself. Lived, felt, breathed, absorbed. It's something else altogether. It's an understanding that has nothing to do with intellectual understanding. It's an understanding that has nothing to do with intellectual understanding. <laughs> so just forget all this business of intellectual understanding, please. You're the one who's always <laughs> but look, but but look who I'm dealing with. <laughs> the divine in all of us. Everything is in its perfect place. Everybody right, is exactly. being exactly <laughs> what they have. <laughs> but I, I'm, but you know, the, this whole uh, this whole exercise is about discriminating. Huh. So those those who can move beyond intellectual understanding will do it. And those who can't, won't. <laughs> and that's fine. So I can talk to them. <laughs> um, but then there's something else. And we also have a touch of that. Three or there was something about distortion that I didn't... Yeah, this whole... Yeah, so this is, there was the explanation in this vision of the distortions. So intellectual understanding is one of those. It's a distortion. Um, uh, operating Walmart on a global scale has in it a divine element of organization and distribution of goods for the sake of the well-being of people, but it is also somewhat distorted. <laughs> so I'm going to come to that in the next section. Sri Aurobindo continues to tell me things. It's truly very interesting. <laughs> There's a sort of instinct which wants everything to be in agreement with the experience one has. But that is a tendency to uniformity. The Supreme's uniform oneness. which is the non-manifest supreme, eternally unchanging, in opposition to the innumerable multiplicity of all the expressions of that oneness. And instinctively, there is always a recoil towards the non-manifest, especially in religious communities. 
and that's and that recoil towards the non towards the unmanifest, which is the unchanging self. We recoil away from it. No, recoil from the multiplicity to, to the unmanifest mm -hmm. oneness. Okay. Because we can't really experience oneness in that multiplicity unless we first remove ourselves from it yogically. Instead of an acceptance of the manifestation in its totality. And that's just what we heard in the canto yesterday. First, Sri Aurobindo narrates the total separation from the manifestation in, in the still self. And then he says, but what about that divine creative force that is behind all of this? Which changes the way we see all the all of this. But in order to change the way we see the all of this, we need to withdraw from it. It's very interesting, and it's the final effect of the return to the origin. The first effect of the return to the origin is simplification, identity, the one, the identical one. And we'll hear this repeated in many cantos. And then there is the movement of the manifestation, the multiple immensity. The second movement, the identification with the all. It's instinctive, she says. In order to get to that identification, you must first withdraw and the religious mistake is to tell everyone that they need to withdraw. Um, <laughs> but it is necessary for yoga to do that. That's what the Purusha does. That's what the Purusha does first. And then the Purusha reunites with the all as itself in the all. But as long as it's involved in the all, it can't see that. So these are the two movements that Sri Aurobindo is constantly narrating, transmitting, reinforcing, and that we will be hearing more and more. Um, so in the Sapta Chatustya, the next one is called Shakti Chatustya. This may be called the city of the temperament or nature in the lower system. In the internal Tree loka of mind, mind, life, and body, manas, prana, anam. The anam is the material, the prana is the dynamic energy in the material, and the manas is the principle of organizing each part for its specific function. And therefore, he says, mind is involved in matter. Mind involved in matter creates the digestive system and the expressive mind and the sensorium in order for it to know its world. And that world is organized according to principles that are knowable. That's mind in matter. To put it from a higher standpoint, 
It is the city of the divine Shakti working in these three principles. So the divine Shakti working in these three principles, mind, life, and matter, is other than these three principles. These are the principles of the pranas. Virya Shakti Chandi Bhavaha Shraddha Iti Shakti Chatustyam. Mm. Virya is a principle that Sri Aurobindo speaks about frequently in the synthesis of yoga. As I said, the synthesis of yoga is just this blown out. So virya is strength of character. And then he iterates something which he reiterates in the synthesis of yoga that has always seemed mysterious to me, but it's becoming clearer. Virya, the strength of character is expressed through the four varnas. the Brahma, Brahmanam, knowledge, wisdom, Brahmana, Shakti, Kshatriya, Shakti, which is the organizer, the lawgiver, the regulator in us, the Vaishya, Shakti, which is the organizer and distributor of goods, of well-being, life. And the Shudra Shakti is the spirit of service. We are always serving others in the process of acquiring what we need. And in order to serve others and provide what we need, goods must be organized. What did you say that Tejas meant? Tejas means uh, force, energy. Energy. Mm -hmm. So there's the Shakti and there's the Tejas. Mm -hmm. The Tejas is the practical, realizable energy in the structures. The Shakti is the original impulse from the Divine for those energies to be organized. So he says, by Virya is meant the fundamental Swabhava Shakti or the energy of the Divine temperament expressing itself in the fourfold type of the Chaturvarnya. Chaturvarnya means four types. And that's all I want to say about that right now. Um, The point is, referring back to the earlier discussion today, that all activity that we engage in is an expression of these four principles. And the whole organization of life in the human world is an expression of these four principles. (laughs) And if each one, each individual and each community and each society and each nation is fulfilling its swabhava, self nature, the nature of itself adequately, even if it's only relative, relatively adequate, but to some extent expressing itself through wisdom, regulation, collective organization, and individual service, then there will be a relative harmony in the community, in the individual, in the society, in the nation. Now, the reason why it's important to know this 
is because when we become receptive to this universal rhythm, we can actually perceive, actually perceive, because it's there, these four principles in action. And when we perceive that, then we realize that everything is in its place. Even if it's not, I mean, even if it's not in accordance with that harmony? Yeah, 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 there is no harmony. There is a principle of harmony, and each thing is an expression of a relative level of that harmony, which is only realized by being above, seated above. So in, in the example of Walmart, for example, you know, it, it, there is a, a principle of harmony in the organization and distribution of goods, but the organization and distribution of goods is itself a relative expression of that harmony. Harmony is a principle. It can only be approximated, as you would know if you tried to tune an instrument. I was just saying that what you said was that when, when those four levels are in relative harmony with each other at each level of the individual and the community, and the, when we get to nation, no, what I said was, you, we can begin to perceive things that happen, and people, and nations, and societies, as relative expressions of these four principles which are ever-present. Before that, you said something. We, well, you interpreted what I said like that, but... <laughs> okay. Excuse me. I'm not saying that anything is an adequate expression of these principles, but that everything is a relative expression of these principles. And when we begin to perceive that, then we understand something that is not an intellectual understanding. It is a direct perception of these four principles in their relative expression. And that they are, that's not a mental thing because we perceive the universal rhythm that is expressing itself in all of the distortions. And to perceive that is to be liberated from a lot of pain and suffering. It's very liberating. And, and, and being in that energy field, you also support it. And you may support it through either positive or negative involvements. If you are a kshatriya by nature, and you perceive injustice in the distribution of goods, then you will energize yourself to correct that imbalance. Like boycotting Walmart? Yeah, which is virtually ineffective, but, you know, bombing it out of existence would be more appropriate. Uh, but then we have, but, but then we have this wisdom domain, this Brahmana Shakti that says, no, no, you can't do that. You've got to work with it. Um, but if you're in the universal rhythmic field, then you can spontaneously adjust your relationships to all of these things according to your own swabhava. And some of us will, will be more predominantly service-oriented individuals, some will be more predominantly oriented regulators and justifiers, and, um, and and so each of us has the opportunity to play his or her role 
according to one's own nature, while at the same time, in a yogic way, encompassing in oneself all of those levels. There will usually still be a dominant one. And in our perception of things, we will notice directly, because it's there, all of these principles at all of their relative levels everywhere in every body, in every organization, society, nation, world, because that is the body of Brahma. That is the embodiment of the divine in this relative world. It is his force through her that becomes this. That's Brahma Vidya. So what surprised me in reading this text in Sri Aurobindo originally was that he bothers to talk about Chaturvarnaya in the context of, of this yoga. But what he's talking about is the universalization of consciousness in the practitioner. This is the world that the Brahman has created for his Leela. And it's our job to see it as it is, not as we think it ought to be. Mm -hmm. Everything is very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, as I'm following you too, I think it's an important to recognize that what you're describing as the body of God is not the world. Like a lot of times people overlay this like pantheistic kind of thing, saying it's all divine, but that's not what you're saying. N none of it's divine. Yeah, exactly. And I think this is a powerful thing to understand. That's what you're saying. But the divine is in all of it. So this is what the Upanishad says. Mm -hmm. Know that totally. to be in all of this and out of all of this at the same time. But it also says that everything is perfectly placed in that greater realm. No, it doesn't say anything is perfect. It says that everything is what it must be. In its rhythm. But no, wait. Does it say not that it is... No, not in its rhythm. In the universal rhythm. In the universal rhythm, that's what I mean. But the universal rhythm encompasses all of this and much beyond that hasn't been realized. Right, exactly. So the only way to notice mm -hmm. that all of this is what it must be is to see it in relation to all of that which it can be. Yes, all of it that it ultimately really is in its true identity. No, it is beyond not. That. It is not at all that. But then how is it actually simultaneously what it appears, and beyond that, what it truly is, the reality. Right, because the reality is what it truly is, and what it appears to be is not what it truly exactly. is. Exactly, but it is in the <coughs> It is in the appearance. Well, this is a matter of seeing, mm -hmm. not a matter of thinking. Of course, but it's the So reality. when you see it, then you will know exactly the difference. Uh, yes, of course. But, the, yes, and the difference is still within that one. Well, don't tell me what the difference <laughs> is, because that's your yes. mind, mm -hmm. and I have my view, and then there is the true thing itself. But and that can't be known intellectually. Yes. No, it cannot so. be known intellectually. Yeah, yeah, so so be when you read the sentence, you have an interpretation, yes. mm -hmm. which is the result of the association of what you see with what your mind has learned, mm -hmm. and then you try to make sense out of it. Mm -hmm. But that's not what we want to do. No, of course not. And that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about precisely seeing the, 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 the reality through the appearance. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm talking about. And, and that is seeing it ex and experiencing it. Right. And that also makes it clear that everything is exactly placed as it should be. And that is no, 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 not as it should be, as it must be. All right, as it must be. 
as it must be. All right. This to me is absolutely amazing what she said here in this. And the effort of transformation limited to a small, small number becomes something far more precious and so forth. All these ideas of spreading the ideal or preparing or churning matter is childish. Childishness, it's human agitation. Yeah, we read that already. Mm-hmm. To me this explains a great deal. Good. But what I would like to ask you about right, is, um, this, to me this is a very uh, puzzling statement. Um, it says here that those, are, who, are, those who are ready for, for the share of Hinduism are yoga are very few. There are even those who have the sense of sacrifice and are ready to have a, a hard and difficult life as long as it leads them or helps them towards this future transformation. But they should not, and this is where it starts, and they should not, they should in no way try to influence others and make them share their own effort. That would be quite unjust. Not only unjust, but extremely clumsy, because it would alter the universal or at least terrestrial rhythm and move a movement. And instead of helping, it would cause conflict and result in chaos. Now, where is the role of teaching here, and where is the role of a guru in this? Yeah. That I think is a very um, well, important yeah. question. So, so I, I want to move. I want to move forward because we'll see that. All right. Okay. So if, if the new consciousness brings new possibilities for us, mm-hmm. the indication is that by surrendering to that, and I'm not saying that anybody can do this except those who are ready to do it, If anyone is ready to do that, then there is the indication that the experience will be of this universal rhythm. Mm -hmm. And in this 1970, five years later, she says about that, I clearly see, the body clearly realizes that it's only its own resistance, its resistance to the truth. That makes it possible for it to suffer. Wherever there is complete adherence, suffering disappears instantly. But it's the same thing for countries and nations. It's the same change of authority. Instead of personal authorities, there will be a divine authority. And the same change of authority causes the unspeakable chaos we live in because of the resistance. So what she's talking about here is the change of the authority of the intellect and its will into a reception of the universal rhythm that determines or can determine, if one allows it, relations and actions and states of being. The nearer a part of the being, any part, draws to the moment of the transition, that is, the more ready it is for that transition, the more sensitive it becomes. And then, and, and this is, refers back to that idea of being burnt. And then, when you reach the point where you can go beyond the stage of problems and see 
with the universal vision. Problems take on to the personal sensitiveness a most intense acuteness. I had noticed it before and now it's recurring for the body. It's acquiring a terrifying sensitiveness. You understand people who don't know why things are like that really get terrified. She's so, not using the word suffering there, she's using the word sensitive, right? Yeah, the, the, if we're going to turn over authority to the universal rhythm, mm -hmm. then we become susceptible to vibrations and meanings and intensities that our mental has learned to screen out. But that's why we practice samatha, so that we are not affected. But it sounds like she is being affected there. But not, not in a way that's unmanageable. As, as we will hear. The possibility of discomfort, it's the same with problems. Only for those who know and who have understood, it's the opportunity of making the last progress, of doing this. because there's still something that's resisting. Basically, what still has the illusion of being something separate must dissolve. So, you know, this is not to say that everyone should be trying to do this. Um, it's saying that some will be having this experience. And so we get instruction on, you know, a little he ahead of the game about how it is. Because there will be those who are ready for this and who want to go through the necessary process. Basically, what still has the illusion of being something separate must dissolve. It must say to itself, it's not my business. I don't exist. That's the best attitude it can take. Then, it goes into the great universal rhythm. So I, my experience is that when we feel this presence and we really move out of mental functioning into the stillness, then we begin to actually feel and see this universal rhythm. If we can hold that, that sense of the universal rhythm, then all those things which we are 
um, thinking about existence shift. And we begin to see um, the relative expressions of that, you know, and to know that they are what they must be. And then we, we stop wasting a lot of energy on um, being agitated by them. But that's a, that's a very peaceful state. And it's a little different than, you know, it, it requires us to adjust our nervous system a little bit, adjust our diet. Um, spend more time being still. And, and that's what they were doing, you know. The mother wasn't moving out of her place and Sri Aurobindo wasn't moving out of his place for 20 years. And, and he was walking for hours. Yeah, of course. But I mean, with regard to exposing oneself in the normal patterns of, yeah, of being behavior. Being still doesn't necessarily mean sitting in a yeah. chair. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. That's mm-hmm. what I'm trying to say. Whatever, whatever one can do mm-hmm. to, to be still mm-hmm. inwardly, and sometimes that means also being still physically or vitally or men- mentally, gives an opportunity to connect with that universal rhythm. And then that begins to create a different pattern of behavior, decision-making, response to conditions. And this seems to be what the mother's presence is about. You know, it's there to help with that shift. that it has a very, very strong feeling of impersonal, transpersonal when one uh, feels this rhythm, don't you think? It is something that actually moves it out of the personal realm. Everything moves out of the personal realm. Universalization is very impersonal. Exactly, exactly. And that's very liberating. That's why I made that comment. I mean, then it's not mm-hmm. personal. Exactly. Useful way to be on Earth these days. Can you take a three-minute break? You may. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think I have time to read this canto.
the mantra of the guru who has moved through all of this and beyond for, for, does one thing for sure. It um, elevates our awareness and moves us out of our mental, vital patterns for a moment. And it gives us a, an, a view, a view is transmitted of a farther point on the road, a farther away reality to be reached. <coughs> and, and as such, it's like a magnet. And this, this is the mystery of time. You know, if in that universal intuitional field we begin to see things in terms of their to be, their potential, and to know things less in terms of their immediate relative appearances, then what this represents is the full view the kingdoms of the greater knowledge. After a measureless moment of the soul, again returning to these surface fields, out of the timeless depths where he had sunk, he heard once more the slow tread of the hours, all once perceived and lived was far away. Himself was to himself his only scene. Above the witness and his universe, he stood in a realm of boundless silences, awaiting the voice that spoke and built the worlds. A light was round him, wide and absolute, a diamond purity of eternal sight. A consciousness lay still, devoid of forms, free, wordless, uncoerced by sign or rule, forever content with only being and bliss, a sheer existence lived in its own peace on the single spirit's bare and infinite ground. Out of the sphere of mind he had arisen, he had left the reign of nature's hues and shades. He dwelt in his self's colorless purity. It was a plane of undetermined spirit that could be a zero or round sum of things. A state in which all cease and all began. All it became that figures the absolute, a high, vast peak whence spirit could see the worlds calms wide epiphany. 
wisdom's mute home, a lonely station of omniscience, a diving board of the eternal's power, a white floor in the house of all delight. Here came the thought that passes beyond thought. Here the still voice which our listening cannot hear. The knowledge by which the knower is the known. the love in which beloved and lover are one. All stood in an original plenitude, hushed and fulfilled before they could create. The glorious dream of their universal act Here was engendered the spiritual birth. Here closed the finite's crawl to the infinite. A thousand roads leaped into eternity, or singing ran to meet God's veilless face. The known released him from its limiting chain. He knocked at the doors of the unknowable. Thence, gazing with an immeasurable outlook, one with self's inlook, into its own pure vasts, he saw the splendor of the spirit's realms, the greatness and wonder of its boundless works, the power and passion leaping from its calm, the rapture of its movement and its rest, and its fire-sweet miracle of transcendent life, the million-pointing, undivided grasp of its vision of one same stupendous all. Its inexhaustible acts in a timeless time, a space that is its own infinity. A glorious multiple of one radiant self answering to joy with joy, to love with love. All there were moving mansions of God bliss, eternal and unique. They lived the one. Their forces are great outbursts of God's truth, and objects are its pure spiritual shapes. Spirit no more is hid from its own view. All sentience is a sea of happiness, and all creation is an act of light. Out of the neutral silence of his soul, he passed to its fields of puissance and of calm and saw the powers that stand above the world, traversed the realms of the supreme idea and sought the summit of created things and the almighty source of cosmic change.
There, knowledge called him to her mystic peaks, where thought is held in a vast internal sense, and feeling swims across a sea of peace, and vision climbs beyond the reach of time. An equal of the first creator seers. Accompanied by an all-revealing light, he moved through regions of transcendent truth, inward, immense, innumerably one. Their distance was his own huge spirit's extent. Delivered from the fictions of the mind, time's triple dividing step baffled no more. Its inevitable and continuous stream, the long flow of its manifesting course, was held in spirit's single wide regard. A universal beauty showed its face. The invisible, deep, fraught significances here sheltered behind forms insensible screen. The invisible, deep, fraught significances here sheltered behind forms in sensible screen, uncovered to him their deathless harmony and the key to the wonder book of common things. In their uniting law stood up, revealed, the multiple measures of the upbuilding force, the lines of the world geometer's technique, the enchantments that uphold the cosmic web and the magic underlying simple shapes. On peaks where silence listens with still heart to the rhythmic meters of the rolling worlds, he served the sessions of the triple fire. On the rim of two continents of slumber and trance, He heard the ever unspoken reality's voice. On the rim of two continents of slumber and trance, he heard the ever unspoken reality's voice awaken revelation's mystic cry, the birthplace found of the sudden infallible word and lived in the rays of an intuitive sun. Absolved from the ligaments of death and sleep. He rode the lightning seas of cosmic mind and crossed the ocean of original sound. On the last step of the supernal birth, 
He trod along extinction's narrow edge. Near the high verges of eternity and mounted the golden ridge of the world dream between the slayer and the savior fires. The belt he reached of the unchanging truth met borders of the inexpressible light and thrilled with the presence of the ineffable. Above him he saw the flaming hierarchies, the wings that fold around created space, the sun-eyed guardians and the golden sphinx and the tiered plains and the immutable lords. A wisdom waiting on omniscience sat voiceless in a vast passivity. It judged not, measured not, nor strove to know, but listened for the veiled, all-seeing thought and the burden of a calm, transcendent voice. He had reached the top of all that can be known. His sight surpassed creation's head and base. Ablaze, the triple heavens revealed their sons. In the Veda, the triple heavens are supermind, overmind, illumined mind. Ablaze, the triple heavens revealed their sons. The obscure abyss exposed its monstrous rule. All but the ultimate mystery was his field. Almost the unknowable disclosed its rim. His self's infinities began to emerge. The hidden universes cried to him. Eternities called to eternities, sending their speechless message still remote. Arisen from the marvel of the depths, and burning from the superconscious heights, and sweeping in great horizontal gyres, a million energies joined and were the one. All flowed immeasurably to one sea. All living forms became its atom homes. A panergy that harmonized all life held now existence in its vast control. A portion of that majesty he was made 
at will. He lived in the unoblivious ray. Well, we might glimpse the unoblivious ray. At will, he lived in the unoblivious ray. In that high realm where no untruth can come, where all are different, And all is one. In the impersonal's ocean without shore, the person in the world spirit anchored road. The person in the world spirit anchored road. It thrilled with the mighty marchings of world force. Its acts were the comrades of God's infinite peace. An adjunct glory and a symbol self, the body was delivered to the soul. An immortal point of power a block of poise in a cosmicity's wide formless surge, a conscious edge of the transcendence might, carving perfection from a bright world stuff, it figured in it a universe's sense. There consciousness was a close and single weft. The far and near were one in spirit space. The moments there were pregnant with all time. The superconscious screen was ripped by thought. Idea rotated symphonies of sight. Sight was a flame throw from identity. Life was a marvelous journey of the spirit, feeling a wave from the universal bliss. In the kingdom of the Spirit's power and light, as if one who arrived out of infinity's womb, he came newborn, infant and limitless, and grew in the wisdom of the timeless child. He was a vast that soon became a son. A great luminous silence whispered to his heart. His knowledge an in view caught unfathomable. An out view by no brief horizons cut. He thought and felt in all. 
His gaze had power. He communed with the incommunicable. Beings of a wider consciousness were his friends. Forms of a larger, subtler make drew near. The gods conversed with him behind life's veil. Neighbor, his being grew to nature's crests. The primal energy took him in its arms. His brain was wrapped in overwhelming light. An all-embracing knowledge seized his heart. Thoughts rose in him no earthly mind can hold. Mites played that never coursed through mortal nerves. He scanned the secrets of the overmind. He bore the rapture of the oversoul. A borderer of the empire of the sun, attuned to the supernal harmonies, he linked creation to the eternal sphere. His finite parts approached their absolutes. His actions framed the movements of the God. His will took up the reins of cosmic force. 